Thank you. Welcome everybody to the last Student Learning and Wellbeing Committee with this board. Let's, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the stolen and unceded lands of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'd like to thank them for their care of this land for all of us. Let's go around the table and introduce ourselves, starting with um, the person who is retiring in six days. He's the one that's glowing. <laughs> I have Richard Zervi, Director of Instruction, Ed Services. Good evening, I'm Davida Marsden, District Vice Principal of Indigenous Education. Jody Langua, Associate Superintendent, Learning Services. Hugh Pham Fraser, District Principal of Equity, Anti-Racism and Non-Discrimination. Carm Carmen Cho, Trustee and Committee Member. Patricia McNeil, Director of Communications. Eric Pru, uh, Vice President at VASE, formerly known as VESTA. Suzette Magri, QP15. Carmen Shadley, Vancouver Secondary Teachers. Brigitte Bjorn, VETFA. Karen Sang, DPA. Hilary Watt, VASA. Mia Liu, student trustee. Janet Fraser, trustee and committee member. Alan Wong, uh, trustee and alternate to the committee. Paul G's, Patrick De Silva, associate superintendent. Uh, David Green, Secretary Treasurer. Helen McGregor, Superintendent. Shazad Samji, Assistant Secretary Treasurer. Oh, and in the back. Oh, don't, don't, don't. There's nobody in the back. Shh. Well, welcome everybody. And um, on the agenda, oh, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce you to our student trustee who was um, acknowledged at our board meeting at the end of September. And so she will be our student trustee for this school year. So welcome. The agenda has, I think, four discussion items. And is, Patricia, did I say, I, Patricia, you're the first item on the agenda. We have no items for approval. The first discussion item is uh, it's a, the education plan and we have a verbal update on the communication. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Is that better? Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's lovely to be here tonight with you all to share a little bit of an update on some of the work that we've been doing in support of the education plan. As we all know, this plan frames our collective work across the district serving students. And this evening's update is really to give you a little bit of a look at some of the materials we developed uh, to support the plan and the work that we're doing across the district. With the new education plan, there was an opportunity to refresh our materials to align not only with the plan, but also with the types of stories and the information about the work that the plan is going to frame for us over the next several years. Uh, we wanted to create a common look and feel, which is a little bit of a challenge in a district this large, um, but to really sort of give some consistency to the messages, the information, the stories, 
and also to align how we do that on the various media and platforms we use uh, throughout the district. And whether that's paper-based presentations like you see here this evening, um, social media, etc. It was a bit of a time for a refresh um, moving forward. And so where we ended up going was, you'll notice the gradient color, you've probably seen quite a bit of it uh, being used in committee meetings and at the board meeting as a standardized background. And this is an incorporation of the existing VSB color palette, but the blending colors was really done intentionally to sort of signal and reflect the inclusivity, the intersectionality of the audiences that we communicate with, with students, of staff, and of the work that we do collectively here at the district. With the education plan, we also wanted to give another visual signal about some of the works and materials that were really uh, reflective of the community as a whole um, to allow a little bit of um, ability to customize for schools, but to also show that we are one school district. So we've come up with a little tagline type logo. You see it used quite extensively, the Our VSB. It's up there in the corner. And what we've done is with the hours, we really want to have a sense of progression, of advancement, and also playfulness and youthfulness and energy to really convey a sense of vibrancy. Um, next slide, please. So from the last slide in this slide, you'll see a little different treatment to the VSB monogram, which is fondly known as our logo. Uh, some interesting tidbits about this, and this took a little digging in the archives, but uh, from the information I found, in 1979, a graphic artist named Sharon Ingram made a logo with chalk on rough black paper. The logo was later digitized and has been modified slightly over the years, but it presents a little bit of a design challenge. Um, essentially with the new mediums that we use to share information and stories. There's an unbalanced and a difficulty, so people stretch the logo, reposition the logo, uh, do very funny things with the logo. And you'll also notice the V in the first, uh, it's the far to my far left, as well as the middle treatment, is actually a check mark, which is a little outdated into how learning and teaching are done uh, these days. So in addition to providing a little bit more of a modern feel and usable graphic um, with the logo and balancing it out, we also wanted to update it to reflect current teaching principles. So you now have our lovely VSB, which is well known uh, and, and very well recognized, but just with a slightly different stylized approach. You'll see some of the treatments that we've used. We've updated the font family to be inclusive and able to reflect a lot of uh, international language characters, uh, especially um, characters within um, First Nations language. Want that to be more inclusive. Uh, we do have some secondary font families that we've been using for a number of years and they work really well together. We looked at the font families to ensure that in their use in the various medium, they would still be accessible um, from a readability standpoint, um, as well as a, a visual uh, standpoint. So as part of this, we've updated a great deal of our materials. We've added templates for schools to use for newsletters, reports, committee meeting agendas. Uh, we've also provided PowerPoint presentations, email signatures, meeting backgrounds, giving people a lot of different options within this updated what I would call brand treatment um, to still allow individuality um, and be reflective of the plan moving forward and the work that it's going to drive. Next slide, please. In addition to the templates and developing new graphic guidelines for use by staff internally um, and in alignment with the brand journalism approach that we've had here over the last number of years, We've also launched a district podcast called VSB After the Bell, and uh, we're quite proud of this. It launched last Thursday, and Superintendent McGregor was the first guest speaker. Um, each Thursday, we will have a new uh, episode, or sorry, the 
last Thursday of every month, not to give ourselves far more work, the last Thursday of every month we'll have a new episode. Uh, and it's really about presenting candid, intimate conversations with the people throughout the district who do the work every day, with students about their experience, um, with staff, uh, and really giving an inside look to the operations of the district and the learning that takes place. Um, so I think that pretty much sums up where we want to go. I will make a special thank you to uh, Mr. Bunnell and the Nightingale Elementary students who actually produced original music for the podcast. And we were quite proud of them. It's quite lovely. And I told you we would help you. <laughs> and like Barb, you, you can subscribe to it on Apple Podcast, um, anywhere you get your podcasts, Spotify, et cetera. And there's always a link posted on the district website as well. That's my update, Chair. Any questions? Don't see any, so we'll move on to um, Jody and Davida. Thank you, Chair. Just before we get started with Davida's uh, portion of the presentation, you'll notice that Patricia did uh, reference the education plan. And I just want to highlight the tie in that everything that you're going to see between um, myself and Davida and Hugh is, you know, directly tied into the education plan. So I know that you're all aware of the equity statement and the edu education plan and the goals, but to refresh everybody's memory, I'm just going to read them through one more time. And, you know, when you're listening to the rest of this presentation, just watch for the ways that everything does tie together. I really want to emphasize that this isn't two or three separate things. It's it's all together. Okay. So the equity plan statement. So Jody, and the education plan can be found at it's on the web page on the website under well you can find go ahead if you go to the uh about us section you will find plans and you can get the flip book there thank you and you can also find it under the vsb policy handbook it's policy num number one thank you that was good team effort which is what we're all about. So the um, education plan does start off with a value statement and it also starts off with um, an equity statement. And I just want to read that equity statement to you. So the Vancouver School Board, a large urban school district located on the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations, respects and supports indigenous ways of knowing and learning. The VSB will create an equitable learning environment where every child can experience a deep sense of belonging and is free to pursue pathways of learning in ways that are authentic to themselves. The VSB will achieve this by having students see themselves in their communities, in the curriculum and in the staff throughout the district, prioritizing student needs by making informed decisions and engaging in open communication with rights holders and stakeholders and actively fighting systems of oppression through relationship building, ongoing communication and transparency. The VSB commitment to equity will be informed by humility and accountability. And that was a very robust process that we went through with community members, staff and rights holders as well. So that was a robust thing and it, it, there's a lot of work that went behind that. That directly obviously ties into the goals and objectives of the education plan. You'll remember that goal one is the Vancouver School Board will improve student achievement, physical and mental well-being and belonging by encouraging students to reach beyond previous boundaries in knowledge and experience improving school environments to ensure they are safe, caring, welcoming and inclusive places for students and families, increasing literacy, numeracy and deep critical and creative thinking, ensuring that students develop and can implement a plan for successful transition upon completion of secondary school, ensuring the alignment among school, district and provincial education plans, reporting students results, student results about performance, well-being and outcomes to the community and using the results to improve the quality and effectiveness of the education and supports provided to students. Goal two, the Vancouver School Board will increase equity by eliminating gaps in achievement and outcomes among students, eliminating racism and discrimination in all forms, evaluating and renewing plans for the improvement of Indigenous learners education, 
improving stewardship of the district's resources by focusing on effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability. Goal three, the Vancouver School Board will continue its reconciliation journey with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit by increasing knowledge, awareness, appreciation of, and respect for Indigenous histories, traditions, cultures, and contributions aligning its policies and practices in a manner consistent with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And finally, by engaging and gathering with the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. So as Davida launches into her um, presentation about the update on what the Indigenous Education Department is doing, I want you to think about what we just heard and watch for the alignment. I just want to make sure that we punctuate the point that this is all tied together. Thank you. 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 And that includes drum awakening ceremonies at many different schools, and that's continuing on to this year. We've done projects like Turtle Island Project, um, and that enhances history of an understanding of Indigenous fur trade and colonization through an Indigenous lens. Um, we brought in people to do brain tanning, which is unheard of uh, in British Columbia. And it was a marvelous event. We had hundreds of kids from K to 12 come and witness and observe and chip in. We did paddles, which was a curriculum development around West Coast canoe culture. We did teepee making, painting, and 215 handprints on our, on our teepees on June 21st, um, 2022. We are creating three canoes, which are loaded, located at Falls Creek with our canoe culture. We have done four directions carving, um, which is legacy carvings. Welcome figures for newcomers welcome center by Chris Barrow. Um, we've hosted the three nations and had a beautiful dinner with all three to bring them together. Reconciliation blankets for each schools uh, made by Deb Sparrow from Musqueam Nation. We created a drum across North and South America video, which was amateur videos brought in all the way across North and South America. It was wonderful. Indigenous Day event, June 21st, 2022, approximately 1,000 students in attendance here at the VSB. Um, this year, we're doing on November 25th, Indigenous Focus Day, which is collective responsibility to understand Indigenous people of Canada and also the new grad requirement. We're bringing our elders into our schools. We have our November camp for grade 12 retreat at Loon Lake. We have our new curriculum being developed, um, which is part of our graduation requirement. Uh, we have our uh, Indigenous Education Committee, which has to do with languages and our subgroups. We have brought in salmon canning and smoking with Elder Martin and Shona Sparrow. This year we'll be doing drums across the world. Indigenous Day, June 21st, 2023, will be happening at the board. Allies and Leaves will be continuing, which help to support Indigenous education, honoring the truth and reconciliation ceremony. Three schools included Lord Roberts, Mackenzie, and Carnarvon. And we have Rick Harry, Master Carver, an honorary chief carving for Vancouver Technical School front door entrance. Which? Thank you, Davida. Any questions? Janet. Thanks, Barb. And I know you went through a lot of things, but just a couple of them caught my attention that I'd like to know a little bit more about. Uh, one is the reconciliation blankets at each school, and one is the welcome figure at the newcomer welcome center. So I, you know, I don't know 
how much in depth you can go, but um, I'm just really curious about um, about those aspects of what you talked about. Um, so the blankets are just being done now by uh, Deb Sparrow. So it's in the process. And what was your second question? I'm sorry. Uh, the Newcomer Welcome Center. Yeah, they carved a, a beautiful welcoming pole there. And and is it installed yet, or is it still in process? Not yet. It's processing. Anyone else? If you haven't made a drum yet, and you get the opportunity to make a drum, grab it. It is such a wonderful experience um, that Davida does. It's uh, it's you need to do it. Uh, and I think the next one is is um, Jody and Hugh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And we can move on to the next slide. All right, thank you. So I just wanted to give everybody here at the table a little up uh, like, and um, context as to how we got to where we are, because it's been a few years and we have some new people around the table. So this um, really did begin with our uh, anti-racism and non-discrimination framework, which was presented to the Policy and Governance Committee in October of 2020. And that was like, Two years ago, time flies. So um, that's where we began this journey and that was based on a board motion. And so uh, as part of that and following up with the whole process, we did engage Urban Matters and they did uh, some consultation with staff and with community. And so we presented that report to policy and governance uh, in December of 2021. And from there, we got um, an anti-racism and non-discrimination advisory group to work on helping us uh, create some goals to fill in the framework, as well as we had a working group, an anti-racism and non-discrimination working group working alongside. So uh, those goals for the anti-racism, the, the equity anti-racism and non-discrimination goals were uh, passed at the public board meeting in June 22. And that brings us up to where we are today. So if I can have the next slide, please. So the first goal, and they're not in any order of importance. They're, there are three goals. They are all equally important, but we have to present them somehow. So we will go in the linear fashion of one, two, and three. Uh, so the first goal was around truth and reconciliation. Uh, and this was the v VSB commits to indigenous ways of knowing, learning, and truth-telling process that includes listening, respecting, and honoring the stories in support of reconciliation in collaboration with Indigenous communities to maintain accountability and to inform policies and decisions. So again, I want to highlight that that goal, all of these three goals came out of the advisory committee working alongside the working group committee. It was comprised of a very diverse uh, group of individuals. Uh, next slide, please. Second goal was around racism and discrimination, and that states the VSB will collectively dismantle systemic, systemic racism and discrimination in all forms by intentionally involving equity-deserving groups, people, in policy and decision-making processes. Next slide, please. And the last goal that, the, that were created is expression of identity and sense of belonging. And that is the VSB will ensure all places and spaces are safe, inclusive, and culturally responsive to foster empathy and respect for all expressions of identity to create a sense of belonging within the school district. So I do wanna um, say that part of the discussions that did occur was based on the feedback that we heard in the Urban Matters What We Heard report. And that report is 300 and some odd pages in length. Um, very detailed uh, data was provided to us. And so we took a look at that report. And as we were creating these goals, it was, the goals were all based on that feedback that we received. So I just wanna make sure that that's understood. Next slide, please. Okay, so upcoming initiatives. Uh, okay, so rather than um, making you read tense, te text, 
dense slides. Um, I'm going to read out the first one, and then Hugh's going to take the second one. Okay. So in the coming year, uh, what we will be doing, uh, some of the things that um, will be included are working with the equity, anti-racism, and non-discrimination uh, working group to create and operationalize objectives and strategies for the three identified goals. So that group is the group that was working alongside the advisory group last year. It was the advisory group that created the goals. The working group is tasked with operationalizing those goals. And so that's one of the biggest tasks we have coming up this year. And we have our first meeting for that group set for November 1st. So that'll be happening shortly. Um, we will be working with the BIPOC community members when shaping our objectives and strategies. And that's, again, part of who comprises the, um, the working group committee. And we'll also be working with the equity, anti-racism and non-discrimination core team to continue to plan professional learning and training opportunities for staff and students. That little core working group, we call it the core because it's a small little group that sort of starts the ball rolling. And then we take, we take the, the um, ideas and the plans out of that group and we take it to the larger groups to work with. And we will also be working with the resources and information collaborative team to look at materials and resources for the district. And that's a team, again, comprised of diverse individuals that will be looking at materials or resources that are coming into the district and people might want to have some questions about, um, you know, how they might work with the district. So that will be ongoing. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Hugh. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, first of all, thank you so much for including me tonight, and it is such an honor to be here. Um, I will continue what Jody had started. Um, I've had a chance. I've just started my uh, new role on September 20th, and uh, lots of reading and lots of background building for myself. And I have been in contact with the um, anti-racism and diversity district resource teacher and has um, caught up on some of the things that she has been working on. She's working with your school leads and helping with co-planning and co-teaching with classroom teachers around the anti-racism curriculum and also helping to design professional learning opportunities that certain schools have reached out um, to ask for. We're working again with the resources and information collaborative team to look at different materials that are available in the community and seeing how they would fit into certain contexts as every school um, is unique and different. Um, also, I've been in touch with our district resource teacher for SOGI and uh, they have been working with um, senior management team for the pronouns and names working group and uh, to work on also policy 17 and then creating the um, administrative procedures that go with that to operationalize that policy so that all our students um, can feel belonging and their own, in their own identities as they uh, work through these years so they are also co-planning with classroom teachers and also providing presentations and professional learning opportunities to staff. And I think that's my update. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Um, so I have one question first of, about parents of Indigenous students. Um, and the question is, how are they going to be included going forward in their kids' education and made to feel welcome and comfortable discussing their concerns and their, um, their questions um, with teachers? Do you have any plans for that? Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, we have numerous ongoing plans with that and we, uh, we have several different ways that we include parents in, in the conversations. The Indigenous Education Department does have staff in all the schools. They have Indigenous education teachers as well as Indigenous education workers. And all of those um, staff are there to speak with the uh, students who identify as Indigenous and to help them raise their voices. Those people connect very directly with 
the parents as well. So that's one way that we support. As you've heard, we have lots of different uh, working groups and committees, and we do include Indigenous um, uh, members as well in those committees, so they have a chance to have input there. So it's, it's several different ways. It's not just one way for sure, and it's going to be ongoing work, and it will morph as we, you know, um, we're going to take a look at the feedback that we get. Uh, the plan and the framework was always to do the baseline, which was the report we, from the How Are We Doing um, from Urban Matters. And so uh, that's our baseline. So we'll take a look ongoing throughout the year and then have a deeper dive look at it the next year to form, inform how we work on it the next year. So I have a couple of more questions if no one else has. Okay. The first one is about students um, with vulnerable health issues who can't be at school while there's no masking and um, the data is not clear from public health. Um, to date, some of them are writing us and saying that they have little to no connection. Um, their kids have little to no connection with education that is working for them and it's going on two and a half years. Um, there's concern about their right to education by law and um, how that's going to be addressed this year. Thank you through the chair. So uh, students who are unable to attend school for any reason do have two options. They are um, able to uh, register in the school district through Vancouver Learning Network, our online program. And the other option that they have is to enroll in homeschooling. And parents that choose to enroll in homeschooling uh, will have uh, access to things like gyms and whatnot and opportunities to um, use other pieces of the facilities as they need and as the facility is able to. But those are the two options for students who are unable to attend school. Can I follow up on that, Chair? I'm sorry, say that again? Can I follow up on that, please? Um, well, that's not on the agenda right now. It's inclusion? Um, well, that's not, not on the agenda right now either. Okay. Um, but what you could do, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to just yep. cut your concern off, is under information okay. item for requests, you could bring that up th then. Okay. Um, so the other question um, is around the reporting systems. Um, we're already receiving calls from people and emails about people who are, um, their children are having issues and the current ones are kids in younger grades of elementary school who um, are or have been having issues around uh, a child who's dysregulating, um, not necessarily, how do I say this? Um, there's no, there, there, there doesn't seem to be any protection of a child who is on the receiving end of the dysregulated behavior of another child. I don't want to disrespect the kid who's struggling but there are kids who are um, who are really struggling just with being interfered with as they try to learn. And the problem that I'm trying to ask about um, within this um, equity, anti-racism and non-discrimination is um, what does the reporting system, how has it changed so that parents have a place where they feel heard? Because we're still hearing that they are, they're in circles that are Byzantine or they're getting lost in them. Through the chair. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going to clarify because I heard you asking about kids who are feeling unsafe. Are you talking specifically about um, students of equity seeking groups or indigenous students or is that all population? Um, uh, we have we have a couple of cases right now that are kids of color. Yeah, but there are other kids who aren't. Um, but the uh, reporting system that where parents would see that their report is being heard and counted. Um, Are you talking about specifically for uh, racialized populations or general? Because if it's general, I think it's something that we could um, put under other information being requested and I'd be happy to. Right, so for the last two and a half years, I've been asking this specifically from an anti-racism perspective since what happened three years ago, I think. Uh, since that was such a big debacle of an inability to report something and get responsive. So this comes from a place of anti-racism and, and discrimination, non-discrimination, um, but it, the tool should serve everyone if it's done well. Um, so yes, it is a question about. Through the chair. Thank you. So. Um, 
if you're talking about gathering race-based data, the ministry is working on forms on that. And if you're talking about how are we doing reporting, so incidences are reported and recorded at the schools through the principal that starts it, and then there are other avenues to be tracking that data. So I think if parents are wanting that information, the best place to start would be with the school-based principal. Okay. And I, th and I think as far as the anti-racism, I think that that's where this all, all came from. This whole, um, all of our attention around anti-racism and, and systemic racism, racism all came about, our, our direction and our focus all came about as a result of what happened at the beginning of, of this trustee's term about <clears throat> how our, we needed this board needed to do more in that regard. So hopefully um, the new board's gonna carry on and see a difference. <clears throat> and literacy. Oh, sorry, were there any more questions? Alan. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. It's not a question, it's a comment uh, with regards to, and <laughs> and the associate superintendent spoke about the uh, urban matters, what we heard engagement report. Um, and I think of all my years, I think that that engagement report, that presentation on De December the 1st of 2021 was the most important report I've ever read. And I think in the future, near future or long-term future, that report needs to be, because, you know, a lot was in that report, a lot of surveys, a lot of engagement was done. So it's important to pull that report back out. I think everyone here probably read it, but if you haven't, um, as the year progresses or next year, that particular report needs to be pulled out because that's the background for the um, three goals that we're, we're, we're trying to address. And so I can't emphasize how important that report is and for that to be pulled out and be forced <laughs> or given to people to read uh, over the years is, is crucial. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alan. It's certainly something that the new board should should have a look at. Perhaps um, when you're on the new board, perhaps when you could yeah. you could suggest that. Yeah. So let's move on to the uh, last speaker, Richard. Sure. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure as um, what is likely going to be my last report in this role to brag about the incredible work that is happening in literacy in this district uh, and um, particularly with the connections that we have to the Ed Plan with goal one around student achievement in the areas of literacy, numeracy, critical thinking and the connections to Indigenous ways of viewing, uh, as well as ensuring that we have a reconciliatory and an anti-racist lens. So this is all work that is currently happening in our district. It is also, I think, particularly poignant that I'm giving this report on World Teacher Day, um, because this is absolutely the work of the teachers in our district, both as resource teachers, uh, as well as classroom teachers. This is the work that they do. Literacy must not be confused with the English language arts in a subject area, but it is central to all of the work that teachers do in all subject areas every single day. So that's my preface. Um, if I could please have, uh, have the next slide. The ministry defines 
that broad use of the term literacy as the ability to understand, critically analyze, and create a variety of forms of communication, including oral, written, visual, digital, and multimedia, to accomplish one's goals. Literacy helps students apply reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills across a variety of subject areas. So you can see that it is very much across curricular interdisciplinary um, consideration or, or approach. Um, uh, let's see, and uh, sorry, the other thing is that um, uh, just a few short weeks ago, we did present on the framework for enhancing student learning of which literacy is one of the goals. We gave some of the highlights in very, very brief overview at that report. Uh, this is going to be an opportunity to share in a little bit more detail what those highlights are and what the current work is um, happening in our district. Next slide, please. So because we are talking about literacy in its broadest form, it's very important, I think, that uh, the committee understands the approach that teachers take. Uh, in previous reports and in previous years, we've often focused on literacy interventions. That is, how do we support kids who are struggling, learners who are struggling in the area of literacy? But I think it's very important that we take a far more comprehensive or global view of how we support literacy for all students. And we do that through a model called RTI, Response to Intervention. Uh, and which I'll just say very, very briefly. So my apologies to those people who are very familiar with the model. But it is based on uh, three tiers. Tier one being the core classroom instruction that happens by classroom teachers to, uh, and that would largely be uh, beneficial and, and um, that approximately 80% of the students would receive all of their instruction through that form. Those students who still may have some struggles or require additional support would benefit from tier two level interventions. And that is typically provided by resource teachers in our schools in targeted or small group instruction. And so that's usually around 15% of our students would benefit from these uh, additional supports. And finally, for our students who may still need additional support to that, we have tier three level supports. And those are the interventions that I'll be speaking a little bit about today, but also the uh, interventions that have typically been the focus of previous reports. Those are intensive individual intervention that uh, happens at the school level. Uh, sometimes there are additional resources brought in from the district to help those students, and that's about 5% of those students. So I'm going to be uh, structuring the rest of the presentation, starting with, level, with tier one, moving into tier two and tier three. If I could have the next slide, please. So the first thing that we did this year was we have uh, implemented a district learning and instruction team. And this team, while it is um, somewhat newly formed, it is actually a consolidation of existing levels of support and existing staff, uh, but uh, are brought together to collaborate and work to provide curriculum support to classroom teachers from kindergarten all the way through to grade 12. So we've taken existing levels of staffing and we've just uh, purposed them and organized them a little bit differently. We have also leveraged technology in a far greater way. So a lot of the uh, time that was spent last year in developing resources is now being launched on the district SharePoint site. Um, the, uh, one of the features of that is a new district kindergarten to grade seven literacy guide that supports classroom literacy instruction. I'll be talking about that in some detail in the next slides. And uh, a numeracy guide is currently under development. We have also published to the SharePoint site uh, a learning and instruction landing uh, page that includes resources specific to literacy, numeracy, and assessment. And we are always working on further developing inquiry-based professional development and network opportunities for staff and students to share their learning and successes. And so I'm going to go through each of these in a tiny bit more detail. Next slide, please. So first of all, we have uh, we took last spring and um, working with a number of groups of teachers and um, literacy specialists, we developed a kindergarten to grade seven literacy guide that is now posted to the SharePoint site. I've given just a little uh, screenshot of, of what teachers, uh, where they would land and where they can get additional help. Um, it also includes quality assessment practices related to literacy. It is not meant to be a prescriptive guide, but it is meant um, to, um, to support teachers. They can choose, they can see where they are, where they might benefit or be interested in uh, trying different strategies with their kids. So it is really meant as a resource for our classroom teachers, not as a prescriptive model. We've also expanded our kindergarten to grade 12 um, teacher resources on assessment 
and we are working, um, we will be working throughout this year in preparing for the 2022-23 implementation of a new provincial reporting order. So we've got a lot that we still have yet to do. Next slide, please. This gives you a little bit of a sense of the, um, the structure and the, um, the organization of our literacy guide. It is online, it's via SharePoint. As I said earlier, a numeracy guide is under development. And it describes uh, classroom-based comprehensive literacy. So this is meant as a tier one level support for those 80% of the kids. So when we talk about literacy, these are the sorts of things that teachers are doing and a resource where they can go to for more information. In a comprehensive literacy program, you've got three broad areas, uh, oral, reading, writing. The guide does start with literacy principles. And then where the guide goes is through pedagogical approaches. And this, if you consider pedagogical report, uh, approaches as entry points for individual students, how we can take students based on who they are, where they are at, and meet them at that place, so uh, another analogy might be the lenses that teachers would use in order to help a student have the curriculum accessible to them. So these are things like discussions on differentiated instruction in the context of literacy or culturally responsive approaches to literacy, indigenous perspectives, diversity and inclusion, student choice, voice and agency, and, and the, the, uh, the role that those play in literacy as well as trauma-informed practice. And I'm not being exhaustive in this either, but you can see that what we're trying to do here is not just say, here's how you can teach literacy to kids, but more importantly, here's some things that you need to take into account in terms of the approach of what it is that you're, you're uh, doing. Then we get into instructional approaches. And so that's more of the, the approaches that teachers, ideas and strategies that teachers can use as activities to help their students with literacy development strategies, balance of, of strategies, variety, gradual release of responsibility, and we give examples of those as well. And some examples are actually in that um, web. You'll see shared leading, reading, read alouds, phonics, um, independent writing, modeled writing, things like that. The guide continues with um, some suggestions and ideas around literacy assessment tools, instructional practices and examples, as well as resources, links, research, and learning opportunities. The um, purpose of having it online is that it is meant to be constantly a work in progress. It is meant to be built upon um, and uh, we want it to be responsive to teachers. So we have a team of teachers who are using that and curating that and regularly updating it. Next slide, please. One of the things that we're very excited about trying this year, and it is, um, it is a trial, um, is that again, within the envelope of existing um, staffing and for the same purposes, uh, we have a teacher who is uh, going to be engaging with um, self-identified schools uh, as a collaborative early literacy residency. And the idea here is that we have a literacy specialist, uh, an early literacy specialist who is part of the team who would go into a uh, school whose staff requested it to work alongside those staff uh, in a collaborative uh, approach to just examine the literacy practice and, and to try different things, uh, to think, to learn, to grow together, to explore and implement differentiated, responsive and inclusive literacy practices. And so these are teams of teachers who are invited to participate in this. We currently have five schools that are interested in doing this. And so our teacher is quite busy. She uh, is only doing uh, two schools at a time. Uh, and then she spends that number of weeks with them on a daily basis, developing relationships with the teachers and the students um, prior to moving to another school. And then there, we're also looking at the avenues where they can go back and reconnect with those teachers that they forged those relationships with. So that's a very um, exciting uh, project as well. And uh, as I say, we've already got five schools who are interested in that. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go through this list, um, but when we talked about professional development opportunities and ways for, for teachers to network the work that our district teachers are doing and supporting other classroom teachers, that is the list of activities that only takes us to the middle of October. That is everything that has happened in September and October from this team 
of teachers as well as other classroom teachers who are volunteering their time to run workshops. So there's enormous support going on for classroom-based literacy practice in both French and English. You're going to see some topics there that might also uh, suggest an overlap with other curricular areas. But again, literacy and numeracy both play a role in all curricular areas. So does assessment. And so they are not things that really can be viewed as, as siloed uh, or standalone. They really do work together. The other thing that happens with the team is they work in very, very close concert with some of the other departments. So the um, Indigenous Education Department, we have the curriculum folks who are working with them as well to ensure that we have Indigenous perspectives embedded in the work that we do, as well as uh, areas such as diversity, equity and inclusion. Next slide, please. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through this, but inquiry um, is a very, very powerful tool for teachers to engage in their own professional development. And so uh, this was the list that I presented um, as part of the FESL last year. Um, many of those activities are continuing. In fact, we have um, Linda Kayser and Judy Halbert uh, who are already signed in off to uh, further sort of a second session of inquiry. Um, we had uh, many schools that were participating in that. We also work with other districts. We are currently working with the Lower Mainland um, Math um, Consortium. I know it's not literacy per se, but we are working with that consortium and developing resources that can benefit all coast metro, metro districts. So we, uh, we sort of try to network that way as well. We have a very, very active, active presence on teams with lots of membership, lots of new channels, uh, lots of new things coming out. Again, the team is very, very busy, very active. Next slide, please. To give you a sense of some of the collaborative inquiries, these were the collaborative inquiries that teachers engaged in last year. And this is based on the uh, process that teachers are invited to participate in, where they can um, request to, have a, to be supported in a collaborative inquiry. We had 686 elementary and 34 secondary teachers last year. Um, participating in formal collaborative inquiries in the last school year. That gives you a bit of a sense of some of the questions that uh, teachers were um, exploring in their groups. So you can see again, it's there's specific or, or um, quite explicit literacy goals, quite explicit numeracy goals. And then there were also those goals where uh, it really was embedded across. I'll give a moment to read through those. If I could go to the next slide, please. School learning plan goals is another avenue where literacy is explored explicitly within our schools. As you know, all schools are required to set um, school learning goals. And uh, last year, uh, we had 10 secondary and 46 elementary schools select a goal that the staff worked on collectively, specifically in the area of literacy, for and numeracy. And I don't want to discount core competencies because they play a very, very significant role in both literacy and numeracy. And so we had a number of schools focusing on that area, as well as a number of other schools looking at instructional practice, uh, generally speaking. But again, uh, it applies to all areas. Um, the smaller font gives you a sense of some of the other themes that school staffs chose as part of their learning goals, many of which overlap uh, or have a direct connection to literacy and numeracy. And I'll have the next slide, please. So um, I know I've gone on a fair bit. Uh, this is all classroom practice. This is all that tier one stuff. So as we go into tier two and tier three, just to give you a, a bit of a sense of where we are continuing to go in uh, terms of interventions and data collection. So the focus that we have this year is uh, to continue our targeted interventions at the elementary level in literacy. And that is with a focus on indigenous learners, students with diverse needs and English language learner learners. Uh, and uh, we are constantly looking at ways that we can adjust our data collection to give us the best sense of student literacy achievement and the impact of interventions on literacy. Next slide, please. 
I've presented this slide in the past. This is uh, one of our interventions that the district supports. It's commonly referred to as reading recovery, but reading recovery is simply that tier three level intervention of a collaborative approach that the entire school staff signs off on when they are participating. It's called uh, CELI or Collaborative Early Literacy Intervention. It's in 45, 44 of our schools um, and uh, it is available in both French and English. Uh, it does follow the RTI triangle, but uh, the specific um, piece to this is that the tier three intervention is supported through reading recovery, which is uh, supported at the district level. Next slide, please. Literacy enhancement teachers, we have 15 of them in 21 of our schools. Uh, and uh, those were, um, that program was started in response to the inner city community link review a number of years ago. Uh, it is meant to provide targeted support for students identified as vulnerable, particularly in the area of literacy achievement. And uh, it is a, a collaboration with teachers around the promotion of effective literacy and language instructional practices and strategies. So what we have is 15 um, literacy enhancement teachers, they're district staff. They are assigned to 21 schools based on the SSI data, so an indication of uh, vulnerability. And those teachers work alongside the other teachers providing individual, small group and whole class enhanced instruction to uh, the learners in that school. Next slide, please. Let's talk, I have six days. <laughs> This is what the literacy enhancement teachers do. I'm going to leave this up here for a few seconds. Um, it is a, a, a wonderful program. The literacy enhancement teachers support each other. They're also supported by a district coordinator and uh, they come together to share materials, to share approaches. They go back into their schools and then they bring back more ideas. There is a data collection component to their work as well, but you can see it's much more than um, being with the kids, they're collaborating with each other, they're providing literacy leadership, school-based professional development, district literacy professional development, and that student support that uh, I talked about. So it's a very, very exciting program. Next slide, please. So as I said, we're looking at ways of collecting data and making adjustments to that data collection to better assess student literacy achievement and the impact. So we continue to leverage the CSL tool, the Communicating Student Learning Tool in K-7 to facilitate um, sort of the satellite data that informs the district. Um, we have the literacy enhancement teachers doing annual data collection and the early literacy district resource teacher who's providing that residency program is also gathering data to uh, inform how we can better support schools and students. We disaggregate our current data by ELL, special education and indigenous uh, learners. And uh, we also have an enhanced services inquiry project. It's very small scale. It's very in, in sort of an internal uh, pilot. It was an opportunity that, that um, we um, offered to facilitate with six of our schools to examine the impact specifically of enhanced services allocation, allocated resources on student outcomes. And that included literacy outcomes as well. So that's, um, it's more helpful to the individual schools so they can really look at how they are using their resources and, and make the adjustments to have the uh, best outcomes for students. I think I'm almost done. What's my next slide? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but this gives you just a brief example of some of the reporting structures that our literacy enhancement teachers use. So it's not just a spreadsheet with uh, empirical data, with numbers, um, but it also captures student voice. And so they really do spend time with their students and they're, they're uh, capturing the student voice and including it in information that can be then shared with parents. They don't do this with all of their students, but we, we uh, do have them do it with a selection of their student, a cross section of their students uh, that they work with uh, longitudinally and they're, they're gathering their stories. The lower right hand, lower left hand image is, is just blocked out to block out some of the personal information, but what it is is simply a screenshot of uh, how some of the teachers are gathering this information digitally because it makes for a wonderful presentation back with the families. Next slide, please. So as we move forward, we're continuing to do all of that work, but all of that work is guided by our foundational questions. How are Vancouver students doing in literacy and how do we know? So that's that adjustments to the data and, and the questions that we're asking about really trying to find out how they're doing. And consequently, once we know, what are our next steps and how do we support teachers to do that work? 
We're continuing to build capacity through professional development, guided support, resources, the sharing of teacher inquiry and learning, support for collaboration among and across school teams, and I think I've given you ample evidence of that, uh, of that work. Uh, we're inviting feedback uh, to the new literacy and numeracy guides and the SharePoint sites. We will be having to look this year at um, how we can support the implementation of next year's provincial reporting order. That is going to be work we're going to have to do. Uh, as well as supporting the rollout of what we are anticipating to be a new provincial resource called the Proficiency Benchmarks. And it is simply a resource for literacy. It is not a provincial assessment tool, um, but a resource that teachers can use in addition to what we have in Vancouver. And uh, we continue to evaluate the effectiveness and sustainability of current models and initiatives. And we're always interested in alternate options. That's an ongoing uh, piece of work. That's the end of my lengthy report. Thank you very much. No wonder you're retiring. God, I'm exhausted. Anybody got any questions? Karen? Thank you, through the chair. The question is, what can parents expect to hear about the pedagogical approaches and instructional uh, approaches their child's teacher or the resource teacher is using if their child is struggling, um, emerging or developing on the proficiency scale? Through the chair. We always encourage parents to have that connection with their teachers. Um, the uh, guide, for instance, that I, I referenced over here is not a prescriptive one. And so individual teachers are going to do things based on the individual needs of their students. They're going to do the formative assessment that informs that instructional cycle and what they do. So parents are best advised to have that, com that communication with the teachers and the resource teachers uh, and, um, and discuss you know, what's going on for my child, um, how can we help them, and what are plans moving forward? Those are the three key questions that uh, we always even ask students uh, around their own uh, assessment is uh, what's going well, what do we need to do, and how are we going to get there? Yep. Okay, I'm going to, I have two people on my list, uh, Janet and Eric. Um, before I do that, this is my last um, chairing committee, and I'm going to go out on the limb here and ask you you don't have to say through the chair. Oh my God, because you always go through the chair, right? You don't have to say it. If you don't go through the chair, I'll let you know. Okay, Janet. Thank you, Chair, and I didn't say through the chair earlier, so <laughs> and you didn't tell me off. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about the new provincial reporting order. Is that a refinement of the framework for enhancing student learning or is that a different thing entirely? It's an entirely different thing and, and really it's it would not be, um, um, I don't think it's appropriate to get into fully at, at a meeting like this. Nonetheless, it is separate from the framework for enhancing learning. It is going to be a provincial reporting order. It is um, scheduled to be in full legislation for September of 2023. So it will be the legislation behind reporting that guides what schools need to do. Uh, and so there are some shifts to uh, what we have been permitted to do under the interim supporting order, a uh, student reporting order. And so we'll have to make some uh, adjustments and make sure that we're supporting um, teachers in that implementation and communicating that with the community. So more to come on that. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the report. Congratulations on it being your final report. Um, my question is related to, or just as a preface, uh, last year they surveyed their membership, the teachers, and over 50% responded that the number one concern they had affecting their uh, work life uh, was the uh, failure to fill of either TTOCs or um, student support workers like SSWs or SSAs. Uh, so I guess my question then are especially keeping in mind that often a failure to fill is on the ground replaced by um, non-enrolling staff like uh, resource teachers. 
Um, my question is then, uh, how has the failure to fill, um, I guess, issue affected the delivery of the tier two and tier three services, considering that those resource teachers are among the first to be pulled to cover when a TTOC does not arrive or is reassigned to another site? Thank you. I can attempt an answer that we actually don't have statistics necessarily on that. Um, that's um, uh, perhaps something that that individual students, individual schools are likely going to have their own reports about that. Um, this was this report and and the work that we are doing at the district level is around how do we support those teachers. Much of the uh, resource teacher support is also then provided through district learning services. Um, and uh, there have certainly been times when through failure to fill, we actually redeploy uh, district level resource teachers to try and fill some of those positions to mitigate some of that so that support isn't necessarily being pulled from kids. Um, but uh, we continue to um, want to support as many kids and as many teachers as we can in as many ways that we can. Any further questions? Um, I have a question, Richard. Um, a as you know, my my um, my teaching um, degree was granted through um, through Facebook, and um, and I've noticed over the the past few weeks there's there's been a um, a new pedagogy about about teaching literacy on Facebook, um, and it's coming from Ontario um, about uh, teaching. I think it's teaching phonics and. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? It, it, uh, it, it's, it came about through the challenge of, of yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering if that's going to have an effect on, on what you've, what, what you've described here at all. Um, because, because um, I guess I'll have to get a new degree if if Facebook says that I have to, you know, what I have to do. Without without getting into it, I guess in in, in too much, um, there is certainly uh, there is always evolving research, uh, particularly through the academics, and so that um, there was a, a report that was published in Ontario uh, just at the end of the last school year um, that. Um, made different people reach different conclusions. Uh, we stand by the uh, comprehensive literacy guide that we create that we created. It is based on the most current established um, peer reviewed research. Um, as things change, we need to modify how we do things, but we recognize the importance uh, the important role that phonics plays, for instance, and and uh, and as I said, oral language as well as writing and reading. And so we try to strike that that balance to ensure that all of those elements are are covered. Um, the guide is not a prescriptive, not meant to be prescriptive. Teachers still have their professional autonomy and they do um, up their uh, professional best at that. This guide is simply meant to um, inform them of things they may not have considered. And uh, that's probably the best answer I can give is as things change, so too does um, do educational resources. I remember I was sitting at an annual general, BCTF annual general meeting and I was coloring in um, coloring in some phonics cards and a person at the microphone gave me SHID for doing these phonics cards and um, and I said you know that's what's going to kill whole language is that attitude. I said, whole language is doing whatever you need to do to help kids learn how to read. And if it's phonics or if it's sight words or if it's whatever you need to do to help kids learn to read, that's what you do. So you don't criticize any kind of program or any kind of um, process that you use to get kids to learn to read, you do what works. So don't stand up there on the, at the microphone and criticize what I'm doing unless you know the student I'm working with. <laughs> yeah. 
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, may I ask a follow up question to my earlier question? You certainly can. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, thank you. You bought me time to write out my question. Um, so uh, this is just a follow up question to the comment earlier that, or the, sorry, your reply earlier that um, the statistics are not available to find out like how many failures to fill like do exist in the system. So um, my question is, would the district see it as valuable to collect these statistics to find out how often the service of students is disrupted through resource teachers um, and this failure to fill situation. Just anecdotally, through the reports of many of our members, the resource teachers who are delivering on-site tier two, or I guess tier three supports, are finding themselves so frequently reassigned or uh, into other classes that they are um, finding it very difficult to form that, like that relationship that you need to be able to form with students who are having a tough time at school in order to actually like uh, cultivate the relationship that would lead to to learning and literacy so just sorry i went on a bit but the question was would they would the district find it valuable to collect the statistics surrounding how often resource teachers are um re redeployed thank you um eric i'm going to answer that because um i i believe that the, that the that HR um, should probably collect that and probably does collect that information and brings it to the personnel committee meeting of the board, which is where we get those kind of st statistics um, on, on failure to fill and stuff. So I don't know who the rep is um, from FACE. Did I pronounce that correctly? Um, but but your rep on that committee should ask that question there or even ask that that information be provided. I also think that it's appropriate for the union to collect that information as well. I don't have any other questions. Well, thank you all for being here at Carmen's and my last uh, student learning and well-being committee. And I want to tell you that personally, I think that this is, oh, Karen. You, Sorry, I you was interrupted waiting. my most emotional. I was waiting for the um, next part that was, um, that was requests for information. Sorry. No, thank you. The next, there are no information items. The next item on the agenda is information item requests. Karen. I have a couple. Um, the first one is um, today is the uh, second day of Yom Kippur, but not the part that affects some um, students so much. Students usually are affected the night before a high holiday. So last night was the big dinner. Um, there were parents who informed schools that that was the one night their kid couldn't make things and several things were scheduled for that evening and we're wondering if um if there could be a better way for high holidays for various groups um just to be honored in terms of i believe there was a grade 12 meeting last night that jewish kids had to miss um there was uh, another event in one of the elementary schools where it was a community event and i think club day was held today at a high school and so kids had to miss those because they're fasting and they're not at school today. So we're wondering if we can, if parents are wondering if there could be a better way just to make sure that high holidays of different groups, there's a couple a year for most, most um, of these types of situations. Um, and I don't think people are asking for days off. They're just asking that their kids not be excluded from major events at the schools. Um, so if, I don't know if that's a request for information or not, but um, if there could be something that is put in place for that. Thank you, Karen. I, I, I don't think it's a request for information, but it's a very good point. And I see Helen um, writing a note and um, I think she'll take care of that for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Can I go ahead? with the next one? Okay. So the next one is the follow up on exclusion of kids who are vulnerable health or their family has a vulnerable health member. Um, 
we early on in the pandemic, we definitely encouraged those families to look to um, to look to the online school that was offered and um, possibly to homeschool. But those are not those are for very different reasons. Um, the online programs are not actually long term beneficial to kids, um, both in high school and in elementary school. And uh, parents are working, so they can't necessarily homeschool their own kids. And we're just wondering why two and a half years into this pandemic, um, this specific group of vulnerable students are being excluded from education. So I guess the request for information is, what kind of plan could come up to support those families and those students? Their mental health is affected, their education is completely interrupted. And the offerings, the two offerings are not, neither are appropriate. Um, and, and the first one, because it's, the programs aren't good. Um, the statistics on how many kids pass it is bad is what I'm saying. Uh, not, I'm not suggesting that the teachers are not excellent teachers, but the program is, um, to the experiences of my own teens, not passable. And my kids do well in school. So um, I, I don't know how that works as a request for information, but um, we do want you to be, a bit, to be aware that um, these students are not getting any education at all two and a half years later. Okay, thanks, Karen. What the process is, is that will be passed on to the staff and the agenda setting committee, and they'll discuss um, how, how that should come back. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I have two more. Uh, the next one is what plans does a VSB putting in place to accommodate kids now or kids who will have long COVID or um, some kids are taking two to three months to recover from, uh, from POTS or from um, uh, myocarditis um, from having had COVID and it doesn't matter if they're vaccinated or not, some kids are being injured. So what kind of education plan is there in place when we know that statistically something like one in 60 kids winds up with something that is significant and will keep them from participating in classroom activities? Yeah, uh, to what extent is a district monitoring attendance in schools and checking uh, the practice of good ventilation um, at peak times of spread. So you're asking for a, a, a detailed COVID report that includes a number of things, including ventilation and absences and... Yeah, we would like to see some information on that to ensure that both students and staff are being kept well in the schools and that we're not sending people home with um, influenza or COVID at this point. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to request some information about counselor shortages. Over this past year, the district and council has collected some feedback and many students from many different schools around this district have said that when they email their counselors to book appointments to for things like course changes or to consult for academic issues or mental health issues, they would have to wait weeks for a reply. Sometimes there would be no reply. And we would attribute that to a shortage in counselors because their plates are so full, it's very difficult for them to pay attention to individual students' well beings. So the question is what steps is the district planning to take to address this shortage in counselors and mental health resources? Again, okay, thank you. And we'll put that question towards staff and they'll decide which, first of all, which committee it should be discussed at and they'll look at which which agenda they could put that on. Most likely personnel, I would think. Okay. Um, and so in relation to that, how can I follow up on what is decided in regards to this issue? I'm sorry, say that again, Mike. How can I follow up on which committee is responsible for this issue? Well, if you don't see it on the agenda of a certain committee within, Helen, a couple of months, So 
also, um, as we would do once it goes to agenda, sending in a conversation is we keep trustees updated around upcoming agenda items. So we'll make sure that you're updated on that. Um, thank you. That's it from me. Thank you. Is there anything else? So this is um, Carmen's and my last uh, Student Learning and Wellbeing Committee meeting. And we'd like to thank all of you for participating in this committee. Um, Carmen, uh, Lois Chan Pedley and I have been working on a subcommittee to um, look at the efficacy of committee, the committee structure um, in order to hopefully bring about some changes in the committee structure to, to make it more um, conducive to, to um, a process that brings about more collegial responses and perhaps even some debate. Um, and, but that will come later when the new board is elected. So I hope that you will contribute to that discussion. But and in any case, thank you for being a part of the what we consider the most important um, committee of all the board committees. Thank you all. Have a safe drive home and uh, good night.